So today we're speaking about Francis Williams, who was the first black poet in the British Empire from Jamaica in the 18th century, and likely our first black Cantab. Francis Williams was the child of free plantation-owning slaves, which were able to support him coming to Cambridge in the 1720s. There's a bit of mystery about Francis Williams' life. It's actually said that the second Duke of Montague supported him to come to Cambridge as a part of a social experiment to demonstrate that black individuals, when given the right education, could match or even surpass the intellectual achievements of whites. The difficulty with this story is that although it's often repeated, it's not actually well corroborated with documentation or evidence. This issue of mystery follows Francis Williams all through his records. There's not particular records that you can reference of matriculation or graduation. In fact, we don't even know what subject he studied or what college he was in. The thing that really ties Francis Williams to Cambridge is the fact that he was thought to study here and that he had a very prolific image taken. The painting itself, this rich, illustrious painting, demonstrates the man's wealth. And this wealth he amassed due to his family's incorporation in the slave trade. And this really shows the really complicated history. I mean, think about it. This man is the child of enslaved people, and yet he paid his way to come to Cambridge through likely the legacy of slavery. And this is a function of the fact that different parts of the British Empire at that time had an economy that depended on slave labor. So it's important here to take a step back. This individual is likely the first black Cantab, and that is why we pay him a lot of attention. But it's important also not to simply forget about the more spotted parts of his legacy. In fact, we're not here to engage in hero worship. We're here to consider his legacy complexly and to situate that in the larger Cambridge narrative. And it's important to note that that wealth alone did not protect him from other social forces that existed at his time. When he returned to Jamaica, he uh, established the first free black school for black children. And he had an assault charge from a white planter. Because of his education, he was able to successfully argue in his own defense. And this threatened white lawmakers and plantation owners who then changed the laws in order to forbid black people from defending themselves from charges that involved white people. The challenge with that is that it shows that regardless of the amount of wealth he had, he still experienced at least some degree of, of social stigma because of his race. So Williams then leaves us with a very complicated legacy that's important to Cambridge and for Cambridge to acknowledge because he's likely the first black person who came here but also gives us an opportunity to reflect on the complicated and contested ways in which these historical figures emerge and gives us an opportunity not simply to celebrate them uncritically, but to actually wrestle with their challenges. British ports and trading centers had profited vastly from the commerce and people and from the trade in slave-grown goods. Equiano's relatively happy fate was untypical. Brutalized lives and premature deaths were the destiny of most slaves. Yet Europeans had traded with black people for many centuries before mass enslavement began. Uh, Africans were appearing as servants in theater, uh, in Elizabethan plays, in Shakespeare, of course, as Othello, who we know about the black Shakespearean figures. But very many uh, poems were written between oh, 1600 and 1640, 1650, about black mistresses. Uh, most of the major English poets wrote about blackness in poems to black mistresses. So that from the early 17th century, it could be said that there is a con poetic consciousness of a, black present, of a black presence. By the 18th century, with the growth of slave plantations, there was a sentimental dimension to this consciousness. It became good taste to weep over the fate of slaves, though in law, slaves were still regarded as mere property. <laughs> 
It's not really until 1772 with the famous Mansfield judgment, the Somerset case, that that again you get um, you get you get something that approximates to a statement that says that slavery is is illegal, but doesn't quite say that. Uh, what the Somerset judgment uh, amounted to was that whilst blacks were still slaves in this country, they could not be forcibly removed and sold in the West Indies. So it was a kind of a compromise. And in fact, in spite, although a lot of black people at the time thought that the Mansfield judgment liberated them, if you read the newspapers, you see that blacks are still being sold in coffee houses, etc. and slavery goes on. Even free blacks were likely to be servants. This is The Countess's Levee by William Hogarth, and it shows a black man serving chocolate to a white lady while a little black boy plays on the floor. This may be a portrait of Samuel Johnson's servant, Francis Barber. The learned doctor treated Barber almost like his son and heir, sending him as a mature student to a grammar school. Uh, black people were mainly at the bottom and the bottom rungs of society. But those who were servants working in noble households particularly could gain considerable status and respectability and um, were in fact capable of getting an education. Even those who finished up as many black people did in the Navy would get an education on the larger men of war. Uh, the larger ships of the Navy carried schools aboard where the boys on board would, boys would, were taught by a schoolmaster. Um, who was employed by the Navy. And many of these schools had children as young as four years old on warships working for them. This is where Equiano first got his education on board ship. Some people actually did make it. I mean, you get Francis Williams, who was patronized by the Duke of Montague because the Duke wanted to find out whether a black, if, if, whether a black person, if, um, if put in a certain environment of learning, could acquire what a European could acquire. So it was almost a social experiment for the Duke of Montague. He took Francis Williams, who was a Jamaican, and put him in a grammar school in England where he learned classics. And then Francis Williams went on to Cambridge where he read mathematics and became a rather polished gentleman. He was well known for writing Latin odes. Williams was then used as, a, as an example of, of what blacks could achieve given the opportunity. Nevertheless, other people uh, despised or had contempt for his achievements. David Hume, no, le no less a character, said that uh, he's like a parrot who has learned a few words. Uh, the first um, authentic black writer in Britain it must be Ignatius Sancho, who was born on a slave ship in 1729. And it seems that uh, he um, had a very unlikely prospects for any kind of future. He was uh, sold as a child in London and brought up by a group of three uh, ugly sisters who treated him rather unpleasantly and treated him virtually as a slave until he met the Duke of Montague. And the Duke of Montague, the man who helped Francis Williams, remember, took him on and um, ultimately uh, took him into service and he became the uh, Montague family butler and as a result had social contacts which led him to become friends with Stern, Garrick and Dr. Johnson as well as far as we know. So he began to mix with the London literati developed a taste for music and the arts, learned music, and wrote a number of pieces. Equiano started off quite differently. Equiano was born in um, in, Af in Africa, he was at Ebo, and um, he was kidnapped at the age of 11 or 12, and um, experienced the horrors of slavery for many years, but was fortunate, you might say, well, fortunate in a way, he called himself fortunate in this, in being bought by comparatively benevolent masters, and uh, serving in the, in the Royal Navy over many years, was able to get an education at school. He was also sent to school when in, in the harbor by his master, and was also looked after by his master's uh, relatives, who also sent him to school and gave him personal instruction. I have long wished to be able to read and write, and for this purpose I took every opportunity to gain instruction, but had made as yet very little progress. However, when I went to London with my master, 
I had soon an opportunity of improving myself, which I gladly embraced. Shortly after my arrival, he sent me to wait upon the Miss Gerins, who had treated me with much kindness when I was there before, and they sent me to school. Equiano was an Igbo, a Nigerian Igbo, and tells us that his 12 years as a child in Igbo is fundamental to his whole life. All that he learned as an Igbo, he says, um, governed his conduct for the rest of his life. And it's interesting that uh, certain of his problems probably are rooted in his memories of Igbo. For example, the Igbo word for master also means something very much like father. And so Equiano, whenever he has a master, sees him as a kind of father. And uh, it, uh, paternalism in Equiano is much more complex than the pejorative use of the word suggests. Equiano became particularly fond of the captain of the ill-fated ship Nancy, who helped him buy his freedom and who died at sea. Every man on board loved this man and regretted his death. But I was exceedingly affected at it, and I found that I did not know till he was gone the strength of my regard for him. Indeed, I had every reason in the world to be attached to him, for besides that he was in general mild, affable, generous, faithful, benevolent, and just, he was to me a friend and a father. And had it pleased Providence that he had died but five months before, I verily believe I should not have obtained my freedom when I did. The frontispiece of Equiano's book shows him holding a Bible, it was very important to him, and he quotes the book of Isaiah on the title page. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Equiano had great faith in providence, both Christian and African. In Igbo, there is a, a belief in, a, in a, an individual spirit called the chi. Um, which um, governs one's life, a rather ambiguous spirit. And Equiano would have been brought up to believe in this chi. And um, he became, uh, at one point, he became, um, he was baptized into the Anglican Church, but uh, left the Anglican Church later in his life and um, became a Calvinist. And I suspect that behind this Calvinism is his belief in chi, because uh, fundamentally, uh, the Igbos are providentialists and believe that one's life is governed by this personal spirit. Equiano speaks in these early chapters of being destined. And the sense of the personal destiny is there in the idea of the chi, which I think, I think it's an Igbo idea. The Igbos have two proverbs, completely contradictory as proverbs often are. One of them says, um, no man can wrestle with his chi. That is, you're under the control of your personal fate. Another proverb says, if a man says yes, his chi says yes. That sounds like Equiano to me. As I was from early years a predestinarian, I thought whatever fate had determined must ever come to pass. And therefore, if ever it were my lot to be freed, nothing could prevent me, although I should at present see no means or hope to obtain my freedom. On the other hand, if it were my fate not to be freed, I never should be so, and all my endeavors for that purpose would be fruitless. In the midst of these thoughts, I therefore looked up with prayers anxiously to God for my liberty. Equiano's faith in God's providence was rewarded with success. All his life as a slave, uh, he'd been attempting to buy back his freedom by petty trading. He was sold by his original master at the age of 19, sold back to America where he was bought by a Quaker who gave him the right to do petty trading on his own account on voyages. And he would buy small things. On one occasion, for example, he bought a few tumblers and sold those. Then on the next journey, he bought some gin and sold some gin to put in the tumblers. And slowly built up, accumulated quite a considerable sum of money as a slave and was able to buy back his freedom. In the 1780s, Equiano's status rose sharply. He was appointed as commissary for stores on an expedition to resettle freed slaves in Sierra Leone. By this time, he was writing his book, which was published in 1789. It was a bestseller, and Equiano became an important figure in the abolition movement. <laughs> 
The first great leader of the movement was Granville Sharp, who fought a number of lawsuits on behalf of Africans. Now, Equiano first met Granville Sharp in the 1770s. And in the 1780s, he was obviously visiting Granville Sharp and uh, helping him with the Granville Sharp's work towards abolition. It was Equiano who reported the terrible Zong case, where 130 or more slaves were thrown overboard and drowned for the insurance. The slaves who had fallen ill were thrown out because insurance could only be claimed on a drowned slave, not one who had died of illness. Remembered years later, it inspired this painting by Turner. The cruelty of the slave trade was Equiano's main target. He also hoped for the abolition of slavery itself, but his attitude to it was formed by his background in Africa. Equiano, remember, was brought up in a slave-owning society by his father, who was himself an owner of slaves. And Equiano stresses in the early chapters how in, when he is in, a, a slave in Africa, he is treated with great courtesy, that Africans treat their slaves properly. And he, his, the great pressure of chapter 5 of Equiano's book is towards the alleviation of the misery of the slaves rather than the abolition of slavery. You stupefy them with stripes and think it necessary to keep them in a state of ignorance. And yet you assert that they are incapable of learning. Why do you use those instruments of torture? Are they fit to be applied by one rational being to another? And are ye not struck with shame and mortification to see the partakers of your nature reduced so low? But above all, are there no dangers attending this mode of treatment? Are you not hourly in dread of an insurrection? The fear had a very real basis. In the New World, slave revolts were frequent and they were savagely repressed. The successful revolt of slaves in Haiti in the 1790s led eventually to the triumph of the anti-slavery cause, although Equiano himself didn't live to see it. Equiano had no particular reason to think that slavery would be abolished in his own lifetime, and in fact it wasn't. So what he would, could do was practical. Again, we have the financial wizard. He could do something about this. He could plead, in fact, for better treatment. He himself was involved in the slave trade and claims that he bought a number of slaves himself for another man and then treated them properly on a plantation. As a result, of which he got more work out of them. Now, this is all very Adam Smithish kind of economics, that uh, if we treat people properly, we make more money out of them. In fact, one of the big issues of uh, the period is to persuade the planters and their supporters that in fact it is profitable to give up slavery uh, if you persuade people that uh, benevolence could go hand in hand uh, with with advantage for financial advantage to yourself you had a much better case for abolition but many of the uh, uh, planters of course argued that uh, abolition would mean the ruin of the finances of the country and this was taken very seriously <laughs> 